Scientists first started noticing mammal declines way back in the late 1980s, and these really started to manifest themselves in critical weight range mammals. These are small and medium sized mammals, from mouse size up to the size of a possum. These declines started occurring in the drier areas of the top end, but now they've expanded throughout the entire region of northern Australia. And now these days you pretty much only find healthy mammal populations in highly productive places like offshore islands like the Tiwis and, and Groot Island. There's been quite a few um, theories is to put forward for the, the reasons for these decline and there's, a, there's certainly evidence that feral cats, altered fire regimes and impacts of introduced herbivores are all playing a role in contributing to these declines. So there were two primary aims of this project. The first was to look at where feral cats occur in the landscape and what best predicts this. Part of that also involves looking at where dingoes are. There's an argument in Australia that dingoes might suppress feral cat populations. So it's important for us to look at where feral cats are and if there's a relationship with dingoes there. So the second aspect was to use that information and then look at where there's a greater number of small and medium sized mammal species and what's predicting that. We were particularly interested in looking at those mammals that have severely declined, such as the black footed tree rat and working out where they're seemingly persisting now. With all this information, we can then get a better understanding of what's driving mammal declines in Northern Australia. Several years ago, we started integrating robust camera trap methods into our, into our survey and research procedures. Trapping was undertaken for several nights, which was pretty standard, but the cameras were left out for several weeks, up to 50 odd days. And the end result was we ended up with several hundred sites over a very large region of the top end. We found that large feral herbivores Feral cats and dingoes all had a negative impact on the number of small and medium sized mammals that we found at each site. So that means that all, as all of those pressures increased, there were fewer mammal species. We also found that those mammals that have severely declined are seemingly now persisting in areas where there's greater habitat productivity. Both feral cats and dingoes were less likely to occur in areas that had a complex habitat structure. For feral cats, we found they avoided areas of greater productivity, unless those areas had also been subjected to frequent and large fires. For dingoes, we found that they avoided rugged habitats. We found no evidence that feral cats were avoiding dingoes. So if a dingo occurred at a site, it didn't change whether or not we saw a feral cat there as well. So for both species, we think they were choosing habitats that have a more simplified habitat structure where they can get greater access to prey because they can hunt more efficiently. So we, as a result of this research, we now have a much greater understanding of what kind of management interventions are required in different settings. So for example, we now know that just focusing on killing cats is unlikely to be very effective, that we really need to be intervening on the fire regimes in combination with reducing feral herbivore impacts but also targeting where in the landscape to do that. That's not to say that there aren't places where it may still be required to have direct intervention on cats but just directly killing cats is unlikely to be very effective. <laughs>